Welcome. Um, this is a re-recording of the January 2024 Boating Access Grants Technical Assistance Trainings. Um, we normally record one of our live sessions that takes place in January, but um, we decided to record a condensed version so that um, anyone that wants to watch it doesn't have to sit through an hour long presentation. So uh, with that, I'm gonna jump right in. My name is Nikki Stricker. I'm the Florida Boating Improvement Program Administrator. Um, my contact information is going to be available at the end of the FBIP slides. Uh, but for now, we're just gonna jump into um, information about our grant programs. Uh, so for any of the grant programs that you learn about today, we do have the requirements that you see on the screen. All of our <clears throat> um, awardees, all of our grant recipients must be registered in E-Verify, um, as well as My Florida Marketplace, and um, they must be enrolled in electronic fund transfers, um, and all of that information is available at the websites that you see. Uh, the Florida Voting Improvement Program is a competitive grant program. We have monies allocated annually from state fuel sales taxes. Counties and municipalities are qualified applicants, and um, any waters in the state of Florida are eligible for this grant program. Uh, this year, the 2024 application period is from January 19th, uh, which at the time of this recording has already started. Uh, through March 20th of 2024. This is a little earlier than we normally would see our application period open, uh, but uh, so in future years, you may see that shift back to early February to early April. Um, our funding, again, comes from fuel sales taxes and vessel registration fees, and for this reason, um, this grant program is intended to benefit motorized boating. So just to be clear about that, uh, kayak and canoe launches are not motorized vessels, or kayaks and canoes are not motorized vessels. So um, FBIP is, is not available to um, fund non-motorized vessel boating access projects. Um, we do have a little bit of federal funding from sport fish restoration um, that may be used to fund some projects if, if it's appropriate, um, but mostly our funding is state and it should be just under $2 million this year or just at $2 million. <clears throat> Uh, we'll touch on some of the eligible projects or types of projects, any boating access facilities, um, your boat ramps, your floating docks, mooring buoys, mooring fields, parking, lighting, restrooms uh, are all el eligible for FBIP. Uh, uniform waterway markers, so whether they're informational or restricted zones or channel markers, that's all eligible. Uh, boater education is also eligible, uh, so we've seen projects for uh, brochures and pamphlets, boater guides, um, educational programs, and um, informational kiosks at boating access points. Uh, technically, this program does also um, allow derelict vessel removal as an allowable um, project. <clears throat> type, um, but we do have a dedicated derelict vessel removal program now at FWC uh, and have for a while, um, and they're, they have more funding and um, they've really streamlined the process. So anybody that's interested in derelict vessel removal, I would encourage um, to reach out to Phil Horning. His information is here, his email address, philip.horning at uh, myfwc.com. Um, he also administers a vessel turn-in program, um, and that program is for boats or vessels that are not derelict yet, but uh, gives 
the owner of the vessel an opportunity to voluntarily turn that vessel over to FWC and save everybody a lot of uh, time and effort. So um, if you're interested in either the derelict vessel removal program or the vessel turn-in program, reach out to Phil Horning. He administers both of those. Um, other voting-related projects that are eligible <clears throat> under FBIP are uh, studies and surveys to determine voting access needs, voter safety projects, uh, projects that promote voting, and then construction that's not associated with a voting facility necessarily like access dredging. Um, so every application that comes in is going to go through two different evaluations. We have a technical evaluation and a qualitative evaluation. The technical evaluation takes place here in the office the, the day that the um, application period closes. Uh, my staff and I are going to go through all of the applications and um, score them based on the measures that you see here. And that is um, based off of the whether the correct number of applications have been submitted, and that is one physical application and one electronic application. Um, the application has to be signed by a person with signature authority. That's another measure, and you'll receive up to five points for each of these measures. Uh, application completeness, so make sure that you don't have any blank areas in your application. If a section doesn't apply to you, um, put an NA in there or something so that I know that it wasn't left blank unintentionally. Um, all of the required attachments, uh, if all of the required attachments are provided, you'll receive five points for that. Um, you'll receive up to five points based on the amount that you're requesting, the amount of funding that you're requesting. Um, and I'll go more into that in the next slide. Um, and then cost share, if you're able to uh, provide any cost share, you will receive all five of these points. So it's all or nothing, um, not based on a percentage of cost share or anything like that. Um, so here is the chart that we determine the um, amount requested points based from. Uh, so if you're requesting a voting access facility um, and you're only requesting $100,000, then you're going to receive five points for that measure in the technical evaluation. If you're <clears throat> requesting um, $200,000 to replace all of your channel markers, that's going to fall here, if you can see my mouse, hopefully, and then the applicant will receive one point for that measure. The qualitative evaluation is going to happen in June. Um, that happens with a uh, an evaluation committee that's comprised of folks from all over FWC throughout different divisions, uh, different areas of expertise, um, including you know manatee experts and um, uh, people here from boating and waterways um, and just. Uh, different divisions around them. The agency, as well as uh, members of the Boating Advisory Council, which is um, a council that's uh, all of the members are appointed by the governor. Um, and in that group, we have members of the boating public, we have um, different military positions, um, uh, the colonel of law enforcement here at FWC. Uh, so lots of different um, areas of expertise involved in that group as well. Um, so very eclectic group of evaluators for the qualitative evaluation um, in June. I think it's June 27th this year, and every applicant will receive an invitation to attend that public meeting. So uh, the qualitative measures are, as you see here, uh, you're going to, the applicant will be awarded up to 70 points based off of uh, the need statement, the project purpose, the expected results and benefits, project goals and timeline, approach and tasks, the budget narrative, and the cost estimate. Um, bonus points are also available for any projects that are located in a county with a population of 100,000 or less, projects located in a coastal county with a high level of boating related activities from individuals outside of their own county 
and then projects located in a county with more than 35,000 registered vessels. Uh, those bonus points, those five bonus points are not cumulative. Um, if you meet any of these measures, you will receive the five bonus points. Um, here are some keys to application success. Make sure that you read the guidelines. Our guidelines are available on the website. Um, yeah, if you have questions about anything, give me a call. Like I said, my, my contact information is going to be available um, at the end of the FBIP slides. Um, start writing and repairing your documents early. Um, I've already received a, a good handful of applications um, where the applicants have asked me to review them and give them feedback, which I've done. Um, so if you would like to um, have your application reviewed and, and have feedback on that as well, then get that application to me. I believe um, I've asked folks to have it in no later than two weeks before the application period ends, which would be March 6th. So if you want feedback and you want time to incorporate that feedback into your final application, get that application to me before March 6th. Um, if you're unsure about any of the requirements, don't assume that it doesn't apply to you. Give me a call. I'm very accessible. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, make sure that you have a paper and an electronic application. Um, if you're <clears throat> overnighting your paper application the, the night before the um, application period ends and you follow up on FedEx's website and you see that it's not going to make it in time, email me that electronic application. You'll lose points in the technical evaluation for not having the paper copy in on time, but at least it will be eligible and uh, that is what you want. Um, make sure that you have a cover letter. Um, if you're applying for more than one project, make sure that your cover letter identifies which project is the priority. Um, that is a requirement of this grant program. Uh, so don't leave that out. Make sure that you have authorization to apply. Uh, so that authorization has to include the individual with the authority to uh, apply for funding and the individual that will be um, assigned as the project manager should the project be awarded. Um, those can be identified by position or by name, I, either way is fine, but both of those have to be in there um, or it is, is not uh, compliant. So make sure that the authorization or resolution has both the, the person with signature authority and the individual that will be um, managing the project if it's awarded. Uh, go through the checklist of attachments. It's the last page in the application uh, and make sure that all of the required attachments are included. If you think something is not um, required for you or for your project, give me a call. We can talk about it. Uh, make sure that your application's in on time. Like I said, if, if the paper copy or the package with the paper copy and your um, uh, thumb drive aren't gonna make it on time, email the application to me so it'll still be eligible. Um, and then permits and exemptions, we've changed the language um, in November of 2022 in the most recent guidelines. Um, we are not requiring permits at the time of application anymore for construction projects. So if you have a construction project and you haven't been able to make the monetary investment yet or um, or your permits just haven't been approved, go ahead and submit your application. And if your project is awarded, you'll have six months from the date of the award letter to get those permits to us. Uh, the timeline for FBIP um, agreements. Uh, so we start off in January with our technical assistance sessions. Uh, the application period for 2024 is opening, uh, has opened January 19th. Applications are due 
no later than close of business on March 20th of this year. Um, technical evaluations are conducted immediately following the application period. And then the, the weeks following, we'll be working on deficiency letters. Um, once those deficiency letters are out, you as the applicant will have 30 days from the date of the letter to resolve those deficiencies uh, before the evaluation committee meets on June 27th. Um, <clears throat> and again, that's a public meeting, so everyone's welcome to join. Uh, some of our evaluators will look for the applicants to be there to ask questions about the application, um, but not always. So um, it, it is wise to plan to be available for that meeting. Uh, first of July, or the first few weeks of July, we'll make those award announcements. And then we spend the next few months um, recovering from the application period and um, drafting agreements. Uh, and then we start seeing those agreements being executed um, in, you know, late, late in the year. Um, this is my information, Nikki Stricker. You can reach me directly at 850-617-9559. Um, and you can reach me at the FBIP email address here or at nikki.stricker at myfwc.com. Um, any and all of the documents that you need for the application period are all available on the FBIP website, which is also where this recording will be. So hopefully you know where that is. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Joshua Brott to talk about the Voting Infrastructure Grant Program. Good morning. As Nikki said, I am Joshua Brott. I'm the administrator of the Voting Infrastructure Grant Program. Uh, this is an annual program. It comes around every year. It's funded through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Service or WISFR. Um, it's available to both public and private applicants. Uh, this is a uh, rather large community of voters and it continues to grow. Uh, we have uh, greater than 600,000 non-trailerable uh, recreational boats in the U.S. This community, like I said, continues to grow. Um, this program targets a specific boater community. This is for folks whose vessels are uh, 26 feet in length or longer. Um, and it is also um, a program which limits access to the facilities and the amenities that this program funds uh, for up to 15 days. And here is a description of that here. We do all kinds of uh, types of work, uh, including construction, renovation, uh, maintenance of the infrastructure facility. And again, the limit to the amount of time that you can stay there is 15 days is designed, of course, to uh, increase the capacity for this particular uh, boater community and, uh, and encourage tourism to um, all types of public and private uh, marinas and facilities up and down both coasts. All right, so in addition to the, um, the E-Verify and the Maya Florida Marketplace registration, we also have a requirement to be registered with SAM.gov. Uh, one of the um, entity identifiers that you will be given as the result of this registration is a new requirement for our agreements. It's the unique entity identifier or UEI. All of our routing documentation requires um, various coding information, and this is one of them, the UEI. So this will be something we'll be asking you to do uh, straight away uh, should you apply for funding through this program. Uh, also, you'll be required to comply with our uh, Federal Financial Accountability and Transparency Act. That's the FAFADA. This is going to be an attachment to an agreement should we get to that point. Uh, if you're awarded and you get an agreement with us, you'll be required to comply with that. Also, uh, be aware that this funding is attached to compliance with the Build America by America Act or BABA. Uh, I like that acronym. It's fun to say. Uh, this requires all infrastructure projects funded uh, with assistance on or after May 14, 2022 to use steel, iron, manufactured products and construction materials that are produced in the United States. You can find more details on that on our landing page. Uh, if you Google Big P guidelines, there's a lot of fun stuff there and I'll talk more about those attachments uh, in a little bit. Okay, 
like I said, requirements for big P facilities designed for transient recreational vehicles at least 26 feet in length. Um, the uh, facilities need to be located on navigable waters, so we want to make sure that you have access not only to the marina, but access to the upland facilities. That's important and these programs success. Uh, largely depends on uh, meeting these requirements. You're going to make sure that the uh, depth of the water at the lowest tide is uh, equal to or greater than six feet. Uh, we want to make sure you got reasonable public access to all recreational vessels. Uh, make sure that the uh, fees you're charging are equitable. Uh, it needs to be open for reasonable periods of time and also uh, provide proper uh, security and safety. So I like to think of this as being the safety service and uh, access umbrella. Most of the things that we're looking to uh, identify fall under uh, those categories. Uh, and then also it needs to be designed uh, to last for a reasonable duration of time as determined through a capital improvement useful life determination. So in your application, you'll notice there's sections which speak to useful life. So anyone who agrees to receive funding has to maintain uh, and sustain uh, the facility uh, with fees that they collect for the useful life and you have to determine what that useful life is. All right, additionally, uh, we spoke about the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act. This is a compliance standard which is common to uh, almost, uh, well, I would say all federal uh, and state funding. Uh, so you'll have to pay uh, special attention to that. That's pretty standard. Um, also, a requirement of any um, agreement if, uh, with us is to install navigational aids to allow for safe passage. Uh, you're also going to be installing sport fish restoration and boating trust fund signage so people are aware where the funding comes from. Um, this funding diverges a bit from state funding in that you're required to provide 25% match. So if you're interested, let's say, uh, in a tier two uh, grant with us, and I'll discuss the difference uh, between the tier one and the tier two in just a moment. Um, you'll be required to provide 25% um, of those funds, uh, and it can't be the one caveat is it can't be from a federal source. Uh, you have to put in a notice of a grant agreement on their deed declaring that there's a federal interest in the property, so that's a requirement, and then also agree that the user fees be used for the ongoing operation and maintenance of the funded infrastructure, right? So I mentioned that already. Okay, this is our timeline. Uh, we are in this first bullet right now, January to February is our technical assistance sessions. That's what we're doing right now. Our April 1st to June 1st, this is our pre-application periods. I strongly urge you to take advantage of this window of time where we can as the uh, grant managers of these programs take a look at an application in its pre-submission phase so that we can give you as much counsel on how to strengthen the application as possible and then the due date for the applications uh, is uh, July 1st. So with the federal program we have two tiers of uh, review. First we're going to review them at the state level and this is basically just a process that we use and we have a public meeting associated with this to determine which applications are strong enough to submit to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for awards. So we don't make any awards here at the state level. We just sort of pick uh, the best applications to submit to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Some will be disqualified um, if not all uh, documents uh, and requirements are submitted and, and that's part of that determination as well. Um, we submit that to U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife by September. OK, here's our two tiers. We've got the tier one projects. The application request minimum is 5,000 and we'll award up to 300,000 per project. Uh, this applicant, uh, these applicants compete with others in the state. So this is a less competitive program and those monies are more available, I guess, uh, by um, by default then the tier two projects because those are competitive nationally. So you, if your project can be completed with uh, $300,000 or less, then that's the tier I would suggest that you focus on. The tier two projects pick up where the tier one leaves off. The minimum is $301,000 and can be awarded up to $1.5 million. 
Um, again, we rank these applicants here at the state level and then also at the federal level. And you're competing in that tier against every other project in this category throughout the United States. This is just a slide which gives you an idea historically of the number of projects that we award uh, per cycle here. So not a lot, right? Three, one, three. Um, we have had quite of a record turnout this year uh, to this technical assistance session. So those numbers will probably uh, be larger this year. This is the total big funding. Right, so this gives you an idea of what we've awarded in past years. This is the amount of match which has been provided. And then here's the total cost here. The types of projects that are eligible are listed here. Right, so this is not everything, but this is most of what we see. Uh, we do a lot of slips. We do a lot of floating docks. Uh, we do a lot of day docks, dinghy docks, um, amenities such as restrooms and showers. Um, we have a project or two right now that is in the mooring system category. Um, any utilities dockside, uh, navigational aids, as I mentioned, uh, fueling stations, uh, dredging. This is a slide on our match requirement, uh, so a minimum of 25% match is required. Uh, again, as long as it's not federally sourced, uh, it should be eligible, right? So any state, single source or combination of sources, OK? So when we do a review, um, your rating is higher incrementally and associated with the percent of match that you provide. So this uh, section here at the bottom um, reflects that. So if you're just giving the minimum 25%, you would not be as competitive, your application wouldn't be, as someone who's providing 50% or higher. So you get a greater score depending on how much match you provide. It's uh, just how much more skin you have in the game. These are must-haves, okay? For your application to be accepted and not denied, you've got to have all of these things here. Uh, the application information and signature, Right, have all your signatures, uh, your written proposal, and it includes these things here, the written proposal. Now, remember, if you go to the, the landing site for the Big P guidelines, it's gonna have um, links to documents and, and aids, uh, which uh, you can use to help you uh, not miss anything, all right? So title page, project abstract summary, the project narrative, uh, the budget narrative, um, all these narratives here, um, are extremely important. This is your opportunity to explain uh, the need for your project uh, and the various uh, budget line items in a way that um, helps it stand out from other applications. So the better you are with those na uh, narratives, the better off your application will uh, be. We also require supporting documentation, so cost estimates, photos, maps, uh, support letters from partners and stakeholders. Uh, the higher quality your photos and maps are, the better. So pay special attention to resolution. If you're copying a map, make sure that nothing got, no detail was lost in the translation, those types of things. Your project narrative must have the need statement, the project purpose, project objectives, expected results, benefits, approach, relationship to other grants, responses to the evaluation criteria. These are all things that are uh, required fields and elements. Again, use those uh, those aids at the bottom of the Big P guidelines uh, page for uh, detailed guidance on how to um, properly meet all of those requirements. Any questions you have about any of it, of course, you can feel free to call me and my contact information will be at the end. OK, our evaluation and scoring criteria, and this is the um, state criteria, right? So this is the, the, the ranking that we'll be doing here at the state level. This is not ranking which determines your award. Again, this is just what helps us determine what applications will be submitted for award. So it is related. And I'll give you an opportunity to uh, to sort of look over those, right? So we've got those that fall into the category of need, access, and cost efficiency. There's 20 points total there. 
match and partnerships, right? So we talked about how match helps you, the more match you have. Uh, innovation is an important one. They're looking for technological innovation. So what has, uh, let's say, increased emphasis on technolo uh, uh, technological advancement? And then permits. So we've got your uh, permitting process, which not only has to go through uh, local review, it goes through state review, and then it also goes through a federal level of review. So any applicant who is farther along uh, or further along in their applicant uh, permit process, the better off your application will do. So there's a spectrum, right? There will be those who apply and have not even um, procured uh, local permits uh, for FDEP and Army Corps of Engineers, let's say. And so those applications will not do as well against uh, applications, let's say, that are midway through that process or are months out from having those procured. The budget narrative, it has to be uh, in line with the line items in your budget, right? A line item for each category and project element is required. Uh, also, uh, attached must be a schedule of values uh, broken out by deliverable. And you want to make sure that you have narratives for those three bullets there at the bottom. This is something which comes up all the time in the reviews uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. When it comes time, they are they are regularly asking questions for additional detail as it relates to proration, program income and user fees. So when you're providing narrative information about those, make sure that they are uh, thorough. OK, so your required supporting documentation. Here are some of those things listed here authorization to apply documentation your site control documentation for upland portion of project site gps project location provide a boundary map of the project area submit existing condition photographs and of course your uh, noaa charts are listed there um, keep in mind when the federal uh, review committee is looking at these applications they're looking at areas from all over the country and they're not going to know this area as well as you do. So uh, the, uh, the most detailed guidance that you can give in terms of these maps and the quality of your photos is going to really help them get a feel for your project and the need and the objectives and all of that that is in your narratives. So extremely important to have that. OK, there's a couple of little uh, timeline charts here in succession, which just give you a rough idea of of uh, when things occur, right? We're right here right now. Then we're going to go through our state review and then we're going to get a federal review. This is the funding announcement. <laughs> I thought that was off. Uh, so, right, so that happens a little bit later. Then we've got our deadline for the application in July 1st, right? Uh, then here we select the projects that we think need to go to Whisper and then they make their announcement way over here in March of 2025, and then we can be doing background work. Um, those that we think that are strong, uh, whether we are sure if it's gonna get awarded or not, it doesn't prevent us from doing work on uh, compliance and permitting so that should an award be given, we're ready to go. And then this is award to completion. Okay, this is kind of speaks to mostly the life cycle of the grant itself once it's awarded okay two years max to obligate start recipient agreement so we'll enter into the agreement here and get our signatures should three years not be enough time we can request an extension and we've got five years max on that project completion and then after the agreement is closed out we've got long-term monitoring right there okay keys to success no surprises here. Read the guidelines, become familiar with those, review the sample proposal. Submit applications early so that we can look at them, make them strong. And then the final is due no later than June. I'm sorry, <laughs> July 1st. This is the uh, this is the pre application deadline. We don't want to get any applications after the June 1st because I'm not going to be able to properly give you any feedback if it comes in any later than that. If I can, I will, but this is the cutoff date for a guarantee. 
All right, make sure you've got your match. And then of course your deadline, July 1st, 2024. No later than that right there. Okay, Joshua Bratt. This is my phone number here. Uh, I monitor both of these email inboxes, so feel free to contact me there. This is the link to the referenced uh, landing page that I mentioned a couple of times. Feel free to reach out to me for any questions that you have.